coming up this evening. Um, this is actually our first um, inaugural event in Abu Dhabi for since a number of years. How many? Since COVID. Since COVID, which seems like a lifetime right now. COVID kept us away. <laughs> so we're back um, and hope to be back again um, in the future too, uh, in the next coming months. Let's get these people.
Thank you, Natalie. Great introduction. Um, as Natalie said, it's great to be back in Abu Dhabi. The meetup started here in May 2013 in Marina Mall, Caribou Coffee. Myself and my former manager, NYU Abu Dhabi, I was the first UX designer there, um, and one colleague. There was, I think, 15 people RSVP, and only my manager and my boss showed up. Um, and I quickly found out that Abu Dhabi is a tough place to meet up. It's amazing to see all of you come here, so thank you for coming. We definitely, as Navi said, we want to come back regularly. It's been a little bit difficult, not only with COVID, but also just having um, someone help us on the ground. Huge round of applause to Romina. Thank you so much. Yes, thank you. We've got our Abu Dhabi ambassador. Um, and she's helped us find the space. It's a great space, I think, but we, we definitely want to explore. We're not tied even in Dubai to one space. Part of the meetup is exploring and finding new spaces. So if you have spaces, if you've got ideas, if you want to hear about a certain topic, if you want to talk, um, we are right now organizing next year. Uh, Natalie, along with Nada, Katral, and Leopold, who is lost but on the way, hopefully will be here soon. Um, are my fellow co-organizers of the meetup. It's grown and it's fantastic to see how quickly, um, at the start of the meetup I was asked, uh, I didn't catch your name, sorry. Yeah. Yeah. Um, are there any other service designers in this country? Am I the only one? It's basically what she asked me. And I told her that 10 years ago there weren't even any other researchers, never mind service design. And it's amazing, even though we are an emerging community, the speed of change is quite significant. And I think that's really great. So um, great to see all of you. The session is being recorded. I also want to tell you that we have a YouTube channel. So check it out, uh, Human Center Design UAE. Not all, but post since the pandemic, everything in the pandemic and post-pandemic has been recorded. And we've got some amazing speakers, all uh, local talent. And we've also on the uh, some of the socials, so if you're taking a photo or you're writing something about tonight, please do so. We're on Instagram, HCD UAE, and on LinkedIn as well. We have our end of year event on Tuesday, next week in Dubai, the Design District. Um, it's a pretty big event, a lot of people coming. It's a really great space. I know it's not around the corner, but um, I'd love to see as many of you as possible on Tuesday. We've got two great speakers, very senior designers in uh, the region, one's a VP, of UX and research, and another one's a senior director in a uh, fintech, Kuwaiti fintech startup, uh, but quite established. And the other thing I'm very excited about um, to tell you is that we are organizing for the first time ever a conference. There's a very cool guy who has done a conference in Munich, German guy, doesn't live here, but he is doing some work in the region, and we're co organizing a conference with him. And the nice thing is we've got a lot of our local talent in terms of some of our best past speakers, as well as new speakers who are in the region and international speakers coming. The tickets you can find, um, I think I mentioned it on, uh, on LinkedIn. I'm happy to share with you a link later or come ask me. There is a 20% discount for members of the meetup and the early bird, I think, ends tomorrow. We didn't plan it, I just checked it today, but um, so yeah, the sooner you get the tickets, obviously they they kind of go up a little bit in price, not too much, but they're not. We're not. It's not like uh, the idea is not to make money out of the conference. It's very much to pay for the costs. It's at the Sofitel in, on March, I think, beginning of March. I don't remember the exact date. And that's the intro. Okay. We didn't have the slide, but I think the the, the, the next thing I kind of wanted to talk about is Natalie said. Um, the meetup is not just a happy path. Here's a great story, everything's great, sunshine. I've had many failures. <laughs> I had some successes too. And I encourage the speakers not only to talk about failures, but also to solicit the crowd to ask questions. It's great that we have a smaller crowd. I actually do miss that about some of the old, the early days in Abu Dhabi because it's a far more interactive discussion. So Natalie's gonna prompt you, but if you have a not even a question, a comment, something you agree, you disagree, it's not all about agreeing, right? It's also about sharing our opinion and our views. Then please 
jump in, put your hand up, grab Navi's attention, um, and let us know. Okay, well, being that the theme is about product designing startups, we'll start with a question of if you're a founder or if you have been brought in by a founder to set up a product design team, how do you ensure in your experience that you start with something well-rounded, something that is good enough for a startup environment? Great question. I'm currently working with a founder of a very early stage startup and I was I was just chatting to Natalie on, on the way here from Dubai about this very challenge that I've seen in many founders, where early on, like some of you described, I'm an engineer, I'm a designer, I'm, I'm everything. The founder might have all of those roles. And they also have experience potentially in that industry. And that comes with a lot of bias. That comes with a lot of, I don't need to do research, I know I don't need to know who my users are. I already know what success looks like. And before I think you even get a designer, my advice and recommendation is to at least have an advisor, at least have a mentor, a coach, uh, form yourself you know, uh, a round table of experts that have got the experience. So before you really, if you either can't afford one or you need to outsource that early validation, it comes, design, as you all know, is not just about moving pixels. It's about strategy. It's about understanding product market fit. It's about working with product. A huge part of product is design. So I think the step one is very much to have that researcher mindset as a founder and validate what does the minimum viable product or the minimum viable experience that I can ship need to look like. And it's a very hard thing to do all on your own. So either a designer or a, an advisor is the right person to start exploring that, start discovering that. Because if you don't and you make assumptions, then you're creating not only possibility of failure, but you're creating waste because you've gone down a long path before validating, and maybe you've overcommitted to that North Star, and there's an opportunity cost where you could have found something very different by just having that right mindset. So in startups, obviously budgets you know, are smaller, and so you try to find talent where you think, okay, a person can do everything. Is um, it hard to find talent when bringing in your first person. I don't even want to say designer because a founder might be seen as a designer. Um, we, we talk about now about people being a generalist, is a specialist. Um, what would you think is really needed in, in, that, in that initial you know, startup? So for, for quite a long time, and, and in Australia, that's definitely something we look for in terms of a profile. It's that T-shaped design. So someone that's got generalist experience across from the service design, research, interaction, UX, UI, and, and they specialize in one of those areas. What I am seeing more recently as design teams are getting cut, not only in the region, but all over the world, is the what's being referred to as the pie yeah. designer. So you've got, we're trying to squeeze more out of people. But in my experience, in, in 20 years, unicorns don't exist. If they do, they're extremely rare. And even if they exist, you have a bias. Because if I'm doing research, if I'm doing service design, I'm doing interaction, I'm doing UI, I'm even coding, every time I'm doing those things, I'm thinking about what is the best thing for that particular thing. As humans, we're not great at saying, Monday, I'm doing sales, and I'm just doing sales. Tuesday, I'm a developer, and I don't care about anything else. We're not great at that. We mix it all up. And that creates huge bias, confirmation bias, um, to name one of them. And, and it's dangerous. So initially, yes, you do want to have someone that isn't just uh, one trick pony that can only do, you do want to have something like 
T or as close as we can get to that pie shape design. Cool. But not just someone that's maybe, even if it's say a product person, right? As long as that product person can do maybe a little bit of say low fidelity and can work with an engineer, you might be able to get away with someone that can still do some research, understand the product, but can also have some of the, the other skills needed and you can try to, in true agile sense, work with, with what you have. Yeah, I'd like to ask actually everyone here in the audience, is everyone being exposed to undertaking multiple um, competencies uh, or are you kind of purely working on UI? I'd love to know how everyone's kind of uh, working on across their companies at the moment. Would anyone like to give some insights, especially here in Abu Dhabi? No, I would pick on you. Yeah. <laughs> Has, let's, let's, let's pick on the founder. Um, <laughs> Am I the only founder here? I think you might be. No, I think there's another, there's another any other founders? founders? Yeah. Yes? Yeah. <laughs> day-to-day -day of a designer should look like. You know, how can I judge if this person is doing what they should do? Uh, be because it's not just you know sitting behind the laptop and doing like all of these schematics and so on. Right? So what what from your perspective, from your experience, what do, what should they do on their you know daily basis? So the, the challenge again not only in the region but especially in the region is that a lot of organizations, not all, there are some that are more mature than others, view designers like an engineer. The product manager is the one that does discovery, and research, yeah. and strategy, and the designer is just the pixel pusher. Yeah. Here's the requirements, build it, maybe you're lucky and they do some testing of that with their customers, but usually they may not. Ideally, you have the trio, design, engineering, and product that argue and disagree, and a designer shouldn't report to a product manager. Because if the designer reports to the product manager, they're not gonna argue and, and then put their job on the line. They should be doing research together, even the engineer. And, and in Australia, I worked, I was fortunate enough to work in a large organization, as Natalie was saying, there were nine designers when I joined, 42 when I left, three years later, in 2018. And I was a, a manager, I wasn't the head of, but I built a team of eight designers, and I thought, <coughs> tooth and nail with my product manager. I complained about it, but my manager, the head of, said, that's healthy, that's good. And his manager said the same thing. That's why you don't report to him and you report to the head of, because only by you arguing, you will have a better product. By you disagreeing, and also we took engineers out of the building to do some research, talk to customers. And they don't do the whole interview, but at the end we gave them, you know, you have five, 10 minutes, ask your questions. And they thought of questions that I never would have dreamed of that were huge and turning points in the product decisions that we make. So in an ideal world, your designers, you need to empower them, elevate them, don't make them to report to a product manager, even if you don't have a head of or a manager of design, they report to somebody else. And then if you're doing discovery, if you're doing research, and it's not only with customers, right? It could be internal research, maybe you're doing some service design, if you want to have a chat to us about that thing. Um, they should be a part of that conversation. And they should be a part of strategy. What are we doing next year? Now, if they don't have the skills or they're not mature enough, then hire more senior designers. Or find them a mentor or get them on a course because designers should be on their day-to-day, -day, depending on your cycle, doing research, doing vision work, doing strategy, stakeholder interviews. They should be running workshops. Design sprints, not just sitting there pushing pixels. 
So and if they don't want to do it, then maybe you have the wrong time. Yeah, but what does their success look like? So what, how can I, you know, measure if they're good performance? What kind of, um, I know design is, is a very creative process, but what kind of like KPIs should I help them account to? Do you want to talk about the way we're friends? For sure. Yeah. So one of the things that I did in both Property Finder and Adobe Present, welcome. Hello. Hello. Leopold walked from Dubai. So. <laughs> But he made it. Just the <laughs> Thank you for coming. Thank you. Um, one of the things that helps is a career growth framework, which looks at the competencies needed for every role and is your grading scale to say a designer needs to do some basic understanding of service design to very experienced understanding of service design, if they are a senior or principal regardless of their title, right? It could be product designer we're talking about, right? Associate, product, senior, principal, product design manager, research, UI, UX, service design. And then there's the human, the, some of the, you know, the, the software skills. You need to have communication skills. You need to be able to have growth mindset. Whatever those competencies are, and a lot of this stuff you can find online are happy to, to share, and you need to measure them regularly. And yes, they might be that T, like we spoke about, but they could improve on some things and say, look, today I'm a very much coming in, my skills in the past have been in UI design and some UX, I can do a bit of UX. I really want to be, not an expert, but be comfortable doing some usability testing, talking to some customers. Can you help me, coach me in how to do that? So maybe it's another designer doing it, or it's a product manager, but you've assessed them not just on their figure skills. Does that make sense? No. And? Yeah, I was yeah, about to say, do you have any head. other designers who feel that they have other, have got user research experience or um, strategy experience? I'm yes. an Oh, you're, oh, you know, <laughs> at the beginning I didn't say who are the reachers in the house. You didn't oh, ask no. about the I'm team. sorry, that's a big, <laughs> big, 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 big faux pas on my side. <laughs> Let's, uh, yeah, so, so your name is? Zen. Zen. So Zen, why don't you tell us about, you know, are you purely a researcher or yeah. are you pie-shaped? Yeah. <laughs> I'm purely a researcher, so I've been working with a company here in uh, Abu Dhabi for the past year and a half. It's called ADSS, and I've done some partnership with Kick Energy. It's not, I don't know if she said that, so we've done some research on social trading in the market in the UAE and Saudi Arabia. And now I just joined Yandex. Russian uh, search engine, and I'm purely a researcher for a while. But I have like uh, long experience in product design. I shifted to research just three years ago, and now I'm doing a master's degree in psychology. So, but then if, researcher. If research. you were working before in product design, you, know, you do have other skill sets. So yeah. I yeah. would say you're more quite shaped now. No, yeah. I'm not doing. Th this is the thing. See, the problem in my company, for example, because I have this experience, because I understand what this product design, I get. To, some weird requests, like build me this specific flow, build me this screen. I can, but this is not part of my job. And I always insist that I cannot deliver a proper deliverable because I haven't done it in like three years. And this is not my job. <laughs> and I'll always push it around to do something like this. And, and that's the challenge. So even in Omnipresent, when Natalie and I were there at the height, so Omnipresent raised $120 million. I was basically handed a lottery ticket. We have one designer, go build the dream team. Here's a million dollars. Amazing, it was a dream. I didn't have it, first thing I did. <laughs> we need service design, we need research from the start, not at the end after you have enough product designers. Now the business didn't ask me for research, they didn't ask me for service design, they had no clue what it was. But I, in my first week, saw all of the, it was a fully remote company, so all of these people, saying the exact same thing you're asking. It's like, how are we accountable for our OKRs, our objective key results? Because every department, by the end of the day, just goes back to does what is important for them. And they were screaming service design, but they didn't know what that term meant. So I was like, okay, well, how do we build this? How do you think about the strategy and the end game at the beginning, not just react to product managers and the business is screaming for, I just need someone to push more pixels, right? 
So even at that point, when we had 11, we still had some product designers that had to do some research, maybe some service design. There was one Natalie, so she couldn't work with everybody all of the time. And they were stretched. And, and my advice to them, the same as Property Finder, was you can't do what they said. You can't please everyone and work a 90 hour week every week. You need to prioritize, have a good prioritization matrix, and work with your product managers to say, okay, I'm supporting three squads. Which is the most important? What are we not doing? And start building a case for we need to either hire more people or change our strategy and do less. We're trying to do too much all the time with not enough resources. So that was um, a very good quote from our CEO. Uh, if you have less, do less. Yeah. Um, and that was very good. That was our CFO. CFO. Do yeah. less with less. Do less with less. Instead of what a lot of companies that are now, you know, killing designers and teams saying, I want you to do more with less. He just said, no, do less with less. And focus better. And that's, again, where strategy comes in and product market fit. And ultimately, like to what you were talking about in the beginning, maybe you have financial success now, but how long will that last if you actually don't have any users? One, two, three, four. It won't last forever. <laughs> Eventually, somebody else will come in and, um, who does have both the finance and the users. And could be Just curious, what was the reaction of the CEO when he heard the CFO <laughs> telling you to do less and less? <laughs> Well, it, it, obviously, it in just, that era, we already saw the. It was the moment that the iceberg was already seen from the Titanic, yeah. and you couldn't turn fast enough. So, so we, we went from 100 people to 500 in a year, and then from 500 to 100 in two to three months. So multiple redundancy rounds. But you learn a lot. I want to learn um, a little bit more from you, Jonathan, about. Holistic design. We were talking about okay, we want to keep in our expertise. We don't. I don't want to be doing a hundred different things at the same time. But in order to really um, create <coughs> and design for the end to end, <coughs> how have you in the past um, nurtured and helped um, grow the craft, the teams to kind of look beyond product pictures and look at things from a systemic. Great question. And this was one of, I think, my failures, that it took me a few companies to learn this. In Australia, like I said, I went from nine to 42 designers. That's a lot of humans. When we got to about 25, 30 designers across three cities, that was amazing. It was the best company, best team I was ever a part of. And it was big enough to keep me fully occupied. And if we had great design culture, that's what I thought was the dream. So then I left. I was a consultant for about a, a year and a half. I came to Property Finder. There were three designers, and I'm like, great, I know the formula. I want to build great design culture, and just, we went, we had off-sites with the team, we had our design values, we did research, I hired a researcher. But if you do design without product, you're gonna fail. If you do design with product, but without engineers, you're gonna fail. And even if you do all three, but you don't include the entire ecosystem, and think of not the product, but the service. How are, what is sales doing? What is customer success doing? And involve them, and make sure that that product manager, because as a head of product design, you're influencing people. You're a lobbyist, you go and you talk to all the other heads of, or directors, or VPs of product, and you, and you can run workshops with them, which I did at Property Finder before joining Omnidra, to say, what does this look like, not just the UX and the screens that we're doing? Let's invite to the room our stakeholders. Let's get them to be a part of it, that solution. Unfortunately, at Property Finder, that understanding, if it's limited to one person, which is a challenge we see with service design in the region and in only person, it's, it's not a formula or a playbook for the whole organization. And that becomes challenging. But my lesson over time was, don't just focus on your own little team or group. You, you need to, like as designers, and I learned this really well in Australia, especially with engineers. We would be like, ah, oh, engineers don't get it. Why don't they get it? Why don't they get it? Why don't we change how we talk to them? Why don't we try to understand what they need from us? It's not one way, it's two ways. 
How can we as designers change what we do? Even if we believe it's 100% right and it's the only way to make their life easier. Yeah. And it's the same with every other department, right? I'd like to know, I mean, does everyone in their organizations or in all their own businesses, how do you interact between other people within the organization to get that more realistic understanding of what's going on and what the, the customer actually experiences from you know the moment that they hit the website to the moment they maybe go on the platform how does everyone kind of keep within their silos or have you had experience going out to other parts of the business yeah so uh, in my experience like this is extremely important uh, to know other team members, other can, teams. Can we know about what is, uh, What's the company? company? Where do you work? So, uh, I'm Kumar Gaurav, by the way, and I work for Wallu. It's a chat support automation company. Wanna do? Sorry. Wanna do? Did you say wanna do? No, no. Wallu. Oh, Wallu. Okay. Okay. It's a, ch a support automation company. We create chatbots and automations and voice automations and so on and so forth. I I will come to my designation later because I have a question sure. on that. Uh, but yeah, so uh, yeah, in my experience, I think I have realized over time like uh, it's very important to have conversation with every team, not only product, not only engineers, but also your support team, also your sales, marketing, and everyone, right? In the in your organization, all the groups, because uh, they give you a very different perspective of the business, right? And I, um, I'm of the opinion that uh, as a product designer or manager or whosoever, as long as you're working in product realm, right, you need to uh, understand business really well. Uh, you just cannot work in a silo of uh, of just being, you know, focused on user. It's good. It's very important to focus on the user as well. Uh, I mean, focus on the user, but also understanding the business is also important because ultimately you need to survive as a, as a business. So I mean, yeah, that's that's what I understand. Support, for example, support team actually uh, the customer support team gives you a very good perspective on what's working with the customer, what isn't working with the customer, what they're complaining about, and so on and so forth. And you learn from that, and you basically try to figure out the solutions. And sometimes the product manager or, or the designer or the stakeholder might not have thought that you know there are areas, gray areas, which is left behind, right? Uh, and that actually gets the attention by the CS, the customer support, and then it comes to the product or design and so on and so forth. So that's and a really important part. I'm curious to know how you funnel those insights to various stakeholders so that they act on it. Yeah, so a lot of times uh, what we used to do, we used to have weekly or you know fortnight sessions with the uh, customer support and try to understand what are the, you know, top five or top 10 areas which you see is a huge miss or huge problem areas. For example, you know, we were uh, working in a, a B2B company and a lot of customers were complaining about reports. You know, the reports in Excel that they get uh, over the email and so on, the formatting wasn't right and so on and so forth. So we used to get a lot of feedback on that and a lot of tickets created on that. Uh, it didn't really caught the attention of the product or you know, other areas, but since we were having a constant conversation with them, uh, we got to know about it. And we asked our product team as well to look into it and then, you know, funnel it out and put it in the, you know, uh, GIA board in the backlog to basically see if we can put it on the priority and pick it up, fix it, and ship it out. A lot of features uh, like that was uh, basically picked and uh, shipped and delivered. It's a really good example. It's actually that approach is actually working to to fix the pain points that are experienced that the customers are currently experiencing. A lot of times, because uh, you know, you can as a product manager or the product designer, you cannot uh, uh, always be right or always be you know uh, knowing everything about your product. The customers give you a lot of feedback, right? And that's that feedback channel. If you have it open, then you get a lot of perspective. I think sales is also one and so on. Yeah, I think, I just want to call out, I think it's great and it's a great source, but one risk I've seen in many companies, not just in the region, even in, in Australian startups that have raised a lot of money without 
design or product managers who understand discovery is that's their only source. And that is one great source, customer support. And even in Omnipresent where we worked, customer support not only was support, they were also operations and delivered a part of the experience. And they came out with a report called Voice of the Customer. So they owned the customer, which is dangerous because it's biased. Yeah. And they can highlight pain that they see from people who complain the most, but that's not a sample of everyone. It's also not purely quantitative. There is some quantitative data in there, but there's in-product data that you can get. There's research you can do. There's service design work you can do. There's the, set, the feedback from sales and what they're hearing. You basically need to get all of your sources and triangulate and properly prioritize. Because many companies have seen it's like, and I asked them, you know, how do you prioritize your features? Well, we just get the ticket, we sit around the table and we vote. Does that sound familiar? Is that what you're smiling? <laughs> Is that what you do? <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> it's, it's, it's close, yeah, yeah. So, so that, all I'm saying is, it could be worse. You could just be sitting around coming up with you know, finger in the air, like we know what the answer is because we are experts. That's probably worse, but this is just dangerous because you you are listening to the loudest voices and not necessarily. Also, if you just purely listen to sales, for example, because sales are trying to close the deal, they're thinking short term, they're not necessarily thinking long term, and they're not. And very seldom do we have, and this is something Natalie and I have seen in like service design, for example. Great service design has data to back up every part of the journey of what success looks like. And not just vanity data, but you know, we, within this flow, success is if the customer has a satisfaction score once they've completed that job to be done of X. And we measure it. And we get feedback in product if it doesn't achieve what it's supposed to achieve. So then, that's direct customer feedback. It's not biased. That's, and, and once you get enough of that, you've got a lot of feedback to prioritize, know what to, to action. Yeah, actually, yeah. just to add to that, I think sure. just, uh, I think I missed to mention the part where, you know, obviously, <laughs> you were right, absolutely right. You hear the loudest voice, uh, and oftentimes, the, those are your largest customers as well. 100%. <laughs> you pay the most, and then you know, we have to do what they said, right? Right. Um, <laughs> But yeah, uh, one approach I have also uh, have been taking quite some time is when the loudest voice actually comes into you know, yelling at you, uh, I get into research with them, try to understand, get on a call, prepare a questionnaire, and basically ask those questions like, where all you know you are facing these problems, or forget about this problem. What is your general problem in, in the product, or what, how you use the product, what your life is, right? Basic research. And that gives a lot of insight. It might not be a problem that CS is saying. It might mm -hmm. be totally different. Reframe. Yeah, but you at least get to you know talk to customer in detail about maybe that issue, and then you figure out more things, and then put it in the product pipeline. So research is is what followed up uh, after you have the loudest voice heard. So no, I'm not. Okay, question. Yes. Uh, as you stated, that the loudest voice that we have to follow that. Okay, what if they are themselves wrong? Because I'm right now facing it. You don't have to follow it. Yeah, we're saying that most organizations, mm -hmm. again, not just in the region, but globally, do follow it. But that's where you need more senior product people, designers, technologists, mm -hmm. who understand that that might give you short-term success but not long term, and to educate, to say, look, that's great. And, and even, you know, another startup I'm uh, advising has the same problem. The customers are B2B and they're very large clients. So he's got few clients, but very large ones. So it's going to be a challenge for him when they say, especially in the early stage, while he's testing an alpha, you have to build this feature to say, Okay, but I want to hear what my other five or six clients are saying. That's not an easy conversation when you have very few and they're paying a lot. 
but it's something that he needs to be able to have the confidence to do because you are not a consultancy designing for one client. And I saw this in many companies, or two clients. In some companies, even you know, large companies, like they have a whole list of sales promise this, so we are basically working for them for free to create these lists. Now, yes, they pay a subscription, but you're not a consultancy doing you know, a backlog of features that, because then the, pro the product becomes Frankenstein's monster. It's just got like, you know. And it goes anyway. <laughs> and then the poor researcher comes and has to do usability testing on this thing. And they're like, uh, excuse me. This is the thing. So what you get from customer service, from customer support, is to support your hypothesis. Those are not proven like pain points. Those are hypotheses. And then you have to take them, test them, refine them, synthesize them. Then you can actually say that they might be prioritized or prioritized or not. So I, I wouldn't listen to a customer support to be honest. As, as no, you, you start with that. It's a point. So yeah. you start taking the notes. Exactly. That's it. Yes. That's the beginning. Yeah. yeah. It might be. But uh, I think uh, to his point, right? Uh, and also, I agree. It's totally correct that what we also do, we just go to the customer who is shouting the loudest that we want this feature. We say, sir. We have five more customers. We cannot make this product just for you. Right. I mean, in more polite way. <laughs> but we just call it out and saying that uh, since we're building a product, we it is a very custom request. We cannot do it because this will harm our product in the long term. And they sometimes understand it, sometimes they push for it, we say no constantly, and then it gets into backlog and it still sits in the backlog. So a lot of time we just say that you know, not possible. So what if we want to process? Yes. Okay. Um, Read my mind. Yeah. Uh, we were talking about collaboration with other departments uh, for this business. Um, in your experience, and I know you've got a good one, uh, so that's why I'm going to ask you the question, is how have you got your product team to be good facilitators um, and collaborate with the rest of the business to improve that end-to-end? What worked? Uh, what was successful? And uh, was the, uh, what did you? What, what was the impact that you got from the way that you tried to get your teams to become better facilitators? Great question. I really want to talk about that. <laughs> um, so. One thing, again, that these three experiences, so again, like a large accounting software company selling software in Australia, close to a thousand engineers, uh, 42 designers, then a property finder with around 400 people and nine designers, um, and then omnipresent that went from one to 11 in six to nine months. Coming to an omnipresent with one designer, I was very conscious of not just creating process for the sake of it. Something that took me probably longer than it should in my career, I'd say definitely a failure or a lesson, right? Because there is no such thing as failure, is we are obsessed with process. Design, product, and process is not business value. Process does not pay the bills. Process does not create a satisfaction for a customer. We love it, it's great. So we want to talk about the business don't care how we do it. They don't care. Your CEO, your founder, doesn't care. Stop making that the bulk of your presentation. So a term I borrowed from the engineers in Australia that I love, hopefully you'll take it away tonight, it's two words, sensible defaults. What that means is, for those of us that have been around a little longer than maybe just graduated from university, we have learned what works and what doesn't work. So we've created our way of working for the company. And just because it worked for one company doesn't mean you come into a new one and you say, we have to do everything this way. So when I came into Omnipresent, I was very careful to choose what are the sensible defaults that I feel based on understanding the current state, so listening, not just coming in going, this is all shit, I have the formula. No one likes the person that comes in and says that. Even if it's true, you can't just come in and say that. You need to be a researcher, you need to listen, you need to study, you need to understand, do that listening to it. And there are some basic process defaults. One of those is a research plan. 
to the first thing I introduced, just before you join. It's one page that's a canvas that I've iterated over time to say, and it's not even if we do research, you could call it a product plan, if you will, it's part of your, your product. What is this thing about? Why are we doing this feature, this capability? Who is it for? What's working, what's not working? Are we, we probably should at some point test it, validate it. How do we do that? It's just a one page. Making product, design, engineering, get around the table and agree on that before we even venture into just, let's just build it or we know everything. And the other big one are systems, as you said, systems thinking, design systems. You could have a very basic and elementary design system, but in order, especially in a large organization that scales fast, for us not to build another Frankenstein monster, but to be consistent, we need to be using the same Lego pieces, right? Everyone knows what a design system is, yes? And it's the same with research systems. So one of the tasks that I pushed hard on Natalie when she joined, besides a lot building service design as a system, was research operations. How do you operationalize research? Now ideally you have a dedicated person that's there to help to do the recruitment for all of your designers, to do, um, you know, make sure that when they have an interview guide, they're not reinventing the wheel. They've got maybe some templates of what's worked in the past. We have a research repository that many organizations, I'm surprised, don't have, like Dovetail, for example. And the way that we analyze research, we can have different ways, and you still create room for creativity, for art, but if you've never done it before, this is a sensible default. And the other great way, in terms of facilitation, which I know I didn't answer, but I got to, is to lead the way by showing them, not just by telling them. So Natalie had a crazy task before she even started and even got her first salary. I said to her, we're going to Montenegro, to Marrakesh in Morocco, and I want you to teach this whole product team and design team what the hell is service design. Very few of them have heard of it and have done it. Not only teach them how to do it, I want you to train the trainer. I want you to make them go out. So it's not just turning up and saying, hey, this is how we do it. There's a lot of work behind the scenes to understand what are the core journeys that exist. Let's get some, break them into groups. Let's get the right people in the right teams to map out these journeys once they understand a little bit about service design. And the great thing was that worked well also in how to facilitate. And we were asked then to run similar workshop for all of sales and all of customer success. And the, what we saw, especially in a remote company, was that there are even bigger silos than non-remote companies, because you don't even know who's in the company. Like these are, okay, once a week you have a call with everybody there, most people have their Zoom turned off, and it's just a name to you. So if in our jobs we don't know what the next person is, how am I gonna say, hey Ahmed, What's your job? How can I help you? And when I throw my part over the fence to you and I've finished sales and now it's operations or whatever, how can I make, help you make your job easier? And by facilitating some of that and also showing how to facilitate and how to create that, you build a culture of collaboration, facilitation, experimentation, and you're also careful with when you introduce things. So, Workshops and offsites are great, but then you need to digitize that or digitalize that. Today I learned the difference between digitize and digitalize. Okay. And I was using it wrong. <laughs> because when it comes to process, it's digitalized. Digitize is purely things. Anyway, now they didn't just come in saying we have to use software. Software is the answer. Here's the best tool to do service design. Everyone uses software. The same as I was, you're careful with when you introduce in a startup the software, because the tool is never going to be the answer. If people aren't using it, it'll be the best software in the world. It's just going to sit there and gather dust. Yeah, right? there's something that I wanted to add is that, yeah, before adding a tool, I wanted to rally everyone around to customer journeys. Because when, even in the product team, no one knew what their customer journeys were, even within their realm of product. 
let alone what the customer journeys are and the moment the SDR speaks to a potential customer. So that was quite powerful to know that no one really knew or no one had one clear defined view of what a customer journey was in any part of a product feature set. Um, and that was a that was a great learning. So then that was a customer journey. So start at least with that before introducing you know complex tools and systems. And secondly, I think it's really important that PMs shouldn't be the only facilitators in a product team. Everyone should be good facilitators. Everyone should be good orchestrators to bring people together. Because any a product team, across the researcher to a product designer. Um, even if someone that's working purely on design systems, if everyone can be built up to learn how to work and collaborate and orchestrate, and it makes the product team extremely helpful. I think it's a great point, which I didn't mention. There's a great book by Mike Montero called Design is a Job. If you haven't heard of it, you can listen to it on Audible or read the book, it's a short book. And he talks about designers owning their work. So again, to your earlier question, is designers should present their work. They should present their research, not have somebody else do it for them. Even if they're not great public speakers, if they want coaching in public speaking, speak to Leopold at the back, he's an excellent coach, and talks about this failure in design in translating to the business, but in also knowing how to present their work. And again, leading by example, I find is the best way. I was asked very early on, we're stretched, there's not enough designers, we need research. So, and there wasn't even enough product people or engineers. So I partnered with another head of product to do some exploratory research. And instead of just doing what they asked as a researcher, which I had done in the past, let's look at the bigger picture here. What is the bigger journey? We have an opportunity for the first piece of research we do to understand within strategy, of an organization hiring people, how do they go about hiring before HR? What's the role of finance? What's the role of the CEO? What's the role of how often we do strategy? Let's map that journey before we hone in on the specific thing that we're after. And not only that, every I was very much aware, every single thing we did was looked at with a magnifying glass. So when we present this, I present it with the head of, to show my entire team that I want you to present your work and present the research and own it as well, right? Not just be like, well, I'm not getting paid enough or it's not my job. Now, sometimes I do agree with you, it's not your job, don't do it. But other times, especially in the early stage startup, if you want to get that growth, you need people who say, everything is my job. There is no job description. Now, within limits, obviously, but there are times when, yes, you need to step up and you need to own what it is that you're, uh, you're doing. and. Praise people, positive reinforcement, build a great culture is another one, right? Slack or however you communicate, when designers did present and you encourage them and push them to do it, that was great, that was awesome. Maybe practice with them, ask them to practice in front of the design team before other people. We, we did a lot of async work, which I learned how to do in this remote startup with Loom. I don't know if people have heard of Loom. It's a great tool, still using it. You can add comments to videos. You can practice and practice and share that. You're not gonna just turn up and do a great talk the first time. You might if you have a lot of experience, but if you don't, you need to practice. And if you're shy or you're just doing Figma, then encourage them and say to them, I wanna help you grow your career. These are the steps you need to do to, to get there. Um, and if you have ideas, um, if you wanna mentor, or if you wanna go on a course, let's invest in, you know, in education. Now, we all, thank you John for that, um, but we all work for companies or run companies where, you know, everything is super working, we're in high speed mode, right? we're always running, 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 and business strategy can change, and then, but sometimes business strategy can change, and not, and product doesn't actually kind of keep up with it, so there is potential to have misalignment. Has anyone experienced that in their companies where business strategies change? Before I ask the question to Jonathan and how you approached it, or vision has changed, but then it just doesn't align with the product? 
I think it happened with us a couple of times here. So basically, we are in the middle of like developing a product. Yeah. And then say, they said, okay, we don't really need these features. And uh, like we already spent like three, four months developing it. And then the whole design changed. And like in the middle of like the designer is like very really frustrated that I feel like it took me like six months to like thinking about it. And now we're saying change it in, in a month. You only like scrap it and just I think it in another thing. So I have like a couple of questions on that side. So usually over here what happens is that so usually the over here the design teams are really very small. So we have like I don't know like twenty engineers and one designer. And uh, what they Our great ratio. Yeah, so <laughs> it is. It is. It is uh, so uh, so basically, what they say is that okay, we have a competitor product. Take a look of that. They are doing great. Copy that. And they just do that. I mean, at start they're motivated to like you know, okay, let me just think about something. And in the end, they were like, okay, everyone's saying this. I mean, competitor product is amazing. Copy their features. I don't know, like change the colors or like something like that. And most, they, most common. So uh, that's very common. So I mean, what's, so what's the best way? What's the what's the best way to do, I mean to ensure that like you know, uh, to make sure that the designers don't get demotivated. And in the end, I mean, I, I see like a lot of like designers. In the end, they earlier they're like very motivated. In the end, they were like, okay, what do what do you want? And <laughs> then they like, okay, I want these five features, and these are the five competitors we have. I like this one the best. Okay, use that. And they just started like you know copy pasting or like something like. Do you have a product design. manager? Sorry? Do you have product manager? We do. We do have product managers. And they are also like, like you said, the designers should like take ownership. And they should be like, okay, this should be like that. But usually what happens, not in my current company, in general, so I've been here in the UAE for the last seven years. So usually the product managers are there, like these are the requirements that needs to be done in like, we need it like designs in like 10 days. So they're like, okay, fine. So I've seen that in a large organization. Those are not product managers. Those are project managers. They might have the title of product manager yeah, or product yeah, owner, yeah. but they're not product managers. Yeah. Because a great product manager steps up and owns the customer yeah. problem. And regardless what they're told to do, they say, okay, that's great. Now, let me do some discovery, ideally with the designer, mm -hmm. and let me validate what exactly the problem is, yeah. and then, look at explore many solutions so the other thing designers i think don't do enough of is we get a requirement list and we're told 10 days that is great i've seen companies in this region that said can you do it by this afternoon can you do it three hours now anyone with a gun to their head is not going to do the best work in their life or if they're told can you do this as fast as you can they're not going to explore they're just going to say well what do you want them to copy on the web which copying someone will never get you ahead. I mean, we actually wrote that on a slide when we did our vision work, because even at an international remote company raising $120 million, your CFO say, just copy the competition. You will never differentiate by copying anyone. You'll never catch up to them by copying them. They're always gonna be ahead. And just because it works for them and their customers, doesn't mean it works for you and your customers. So the best thing as a designer, I say, is to test the competition's product with your people. Validate. It might look shiny and their marketing yeah. could be amazing, but maybe it's rubbish. Maybe it's not the right design or pattern. Or but I want to add, approach. in addition to user testing, I think one of the great kind of uh, armor that you can have for a PM and also a designer is to un understand how to use data to your advantage to mm. your yeah. point. Um, what we found at Omnipresent was that there data was only in the used within the data team and not knew no one knew how to access, it, the, access the data it. and it wasn't democratized across the yeah. organization. Yeah. So when you have when you're in a situation where they're saying just do this, just do that, but then you're able to bring in the data sources that say, well they, it showed in our data that customers are not doing this or are, are actually doing something in a different way or the conversions are, are this. Yeah. Facts. Yeah. This right. is something that I have also said, like, like when you start building a company that like make sure you have all kind of data because you're not focusing on sales or how many customers you have. You have been focused also on the churn rates. And you have all important different kind of data 
and that you don't like when you build KPIs that you really think what KPIs you think like choose that you know they don't end up clashing between example teams. And then when you have like the, the data available and everybody has access to it and everybody can make like decisions and that doesn't sit in, in some behind some data scientists and it's difficult to get or people don't understand Power BI, you know, no, nothing is written open there. Nobody, for example, from customer customer experience or somebody who can't like access it can't understand it. So I think that's very important. I think yeah. the, the the other point is you need to ask them what success looks like. So there are organizations that are large making a lot of money. So you could bring the best data in the world. You could bring all the answers. They don't care. If that's the case, and you're a designer that cares about your job or a product manager, then you have to leave. There's no other yeah. choice. Yeah. You're in the wrong place. They're not going to change. You're not going to change. Yeah. It's a large organization that's like financial institutions, right? They're making a lot of money. Yeah. Success is not the customer being happy. There's a lot of unhappy customers. They don't care. Yeah. Success is not delivering by on speed or on time. It, it could be. Maybe success is delivered as fast as possible, and they don't care what the future is. So if you're okay with just being moving pixels, then fine. But otherwise, you need to find a better job. There's no other answer. Sure. Sure. Now, it could take time, but you, you're not going to grow in that kind of environment. But in other places that are at least more aware, then yes, if you bring data <coughs> and if you bring evidence, they will listen. And it's not your opinion. I mean, the other great thing from, uh, you know, I recently ran into by a workshop on usability testing that I've ran many times. I find usability testing a really powerful tool to not invite people to sit in another room while it's happening or watch the video after. This is the customer failing with this feature. It's not you saying it. You're letting the true voice of the customer, not somebody's analysis of opinion of data, and you have enough data points, right? Not one customer yeah. saying it. But if you can show that here is the pain of the customer, and this is why I believe we should do feature X. And how important do you think it is that you have a designer who understands the domain? Rather than that, so there's going to be a great designer. So for example, someone who works in the property sector for last 10 years understands like all the nitty gritties that what my like, customer wants and like, you know, it's a better understanding of that. So he's great in the property sector, but then, for example, he moves to like financial institute. And over there, do you think that, I mean, this is a complete startup. So is this a good idea to have a designer who understands a domain or someone who is just great at it and he will figure it out himself? It's a good question. Personally, my, my opinion is that designers don't need to be experts in any subject matter. We are facilitators. We are there to draw the expertise from the people around us. A great designer doesn't need to be an expert. I did, for example, one of the best projects I worked on in Australia was on, in less than three months, we delivered from zero to a working, very complicated bit of software for offshore decommissioning of oil rigs. Very heavy engineering. Now, the founders were experts. We just took out of their head and simplified. The fact that we didn't know was actually better because we didn't have a huge bias. Now, yes, obviously, industry knowledge is counts for a lot, especially if you've done research and you're bringing your past knowledge of research to what you're doing, even if you're bringing patterns or design, but there's nothing new under the sun. As we look at design and design systems, they're kind of merging, you know what I mean? So I'm, I'm gonna kind of do a, a safe answer of like saying yes and no, because it's still, create bias, like a great designer, even if they're a great visual designer, should be able to work within any parameters, and they can do an environmental scan. They can look at how are all the banks doing this, or yeah. or whatever. I mean, from a cons as a what consultancy point of view, we don't ever focus on a particular vertical. Right. So, I'm like, yeah, I can work in, it's, it's all a matter of curiosity. You know how to get the information that you want, you can apply it to any uh, industry or vertical. That would be applicable to a designer, PM, right. yeah, or even an engineer. Right. I'm conscious of time. How yes. are we doing? It's eight o'clock. Okay, so I just want to maybe um, what, Talk about 
about product. Yeah, we're talking about product. Now, we've all, I don't know if all of you experienced last, this time last year, I mean, a lot of tech companies um, have induced um, a lot of headcount. Maybe some of you were impacted by it, but you know, Dubai, and, and, and I don't know about Abu Dhabi, but you know, there was quite a few layoffs. So coming from a, a design team where you have maybe 40 or 11 people, and then you're down by 50%, in your experience, how do you, as a as a, a design leader, try to still maintain that design quality? Again, I think I think it's about some of what we spoke about. So it's doing less with less. Mm -hmm. It's about focus. It's about not only design thinking but product thinking. And just to deviate slightly in terms of product, very few companies are benchmarking their core jobs to be done. Not a single one that I've ever worked with. I've always introduced it. Does everyone understand the concept of jobs to be done? Does everyone understand jobs to be done? What are the, why do people come to you in the first place? That won't change over time dramatically. Like you could create a building feature, but whatever your reason for being, they're still coming to you for that reason. You should be, at least once a year, ideally more often than that, measuring that. How long does it take? What's the satisfaction of doing that? And the feedback of that should feed your product and your strategy. Now, a few companies are doing it. They're always building the next shiny feature. Instead of saying, every year, at such and such a month, we will test this. And even if you have a smaller team, you need to help your founders, your stakeholders, to focus on, why are we here in the first place? Let's not let the core reason why people come here to fade away or to lose out to the competition over building, oh, the competition's doing this, we gotta copy that, we gotta copy that. So, it, and, and it's about, I think the, the other important one, it's, it's culture as well, which we've kind of blended into a lot of what we spoke about, but it's making sure that people don't panic, which humans always do in a crisis, right? First rule number one. We, even when I, Natalie and I left, I was very conscious and you know, about kind of about the Papa Bear design manager that I am. The people that stayed and had a job, telling them, look, how are you gonna deal with this? You're two designers, 12 product managers, I don't know, roughly. How, that, that's what exists today. I'm still in touch with those two designers. I hired them before and hopefully I'll hire them in the future. But how do you then readjust and what are you not doing? And what are you clear on, like we heard earlier, and you know, service design died the day Natalie and I left the building. It's very sad. Six months later, they're now talking about, hey, shit, we need service design. <laughs> it's a bit late when you haven't you, you know, continued or you've let these things, you know, haven't renewed your contracts of where you've kept all of your, your uh, blueprints. Research took a significant hit, almost died, but as a, uh, product design manager, senior product designer, you need to be ruthless and say, I can only do so much, this is how much I can do, I want to stay here, um, and what are what is our new way of working, what are our new sensible defaults, what's our new values, right? I think also, how can you, for example, for research, how, there's always the assumption that research takes a longer time to do, how can you make it lean, yet still impactful, still or even lean? Or even if you that. Thought, yes. And it's how have you kind of gone from here, you know, research being big like this to making it lean and equally or even more. Um, so it, it's value. very much, uh, there's another great book called, uh, I think it's Thinking in Bets, which is about if you as a product person were to put mon your money, I know betting is real, but if you were to put your money behind a certain feature or behind research, where, if this was your company, if you were the founder, where would you bet? Validate the biggest bets. Now that's what you do anyway, even with 50 designs. But if you've got even less, if you've only got very limited amount of time, you can only do one piece of research in this quarter or this half of the year. Looking at your roadmap, your strategy, where would that be? It's, it's asking those questions and it's, again, hopefully it's the design, those mature designers that are left, that are saying, we are no knowns, we just need to build. Can we use, I don't know, somebody in marketing who can do 
Maybe they're not a product designer, but they can do some design. Can we borrow some of their time? Who else can an engineer, who's a great front-end developer, with our mature, hopefully, design system, do a little bit where we already have no knowns, and maybe we polish it, maybe we change our ways of working. So you, you need to create a new paradigm and look at what are we exploring, obviously a lot less, and what are we executing, and, and hopefully lobbying to execute less, to do the, those core things that are part of the core problem. So it's not removing those things completely from the, from the design process, it's just doing, putting your better new achievements, so yeah, better prioritization. Yeah. Yeah. Has anyone else experienced that in their workplaces? where research has been completely killed or service design or, yeah? Yeah. Would you like to share an experience? Yeah, uh, some, for example, in my previous work, sometimes the, we received some, some requirements and, uh, wow, well, we need to build this. Okay, let's do the research. Let's talk with some users. No, 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 we don't have time to do this. And we, we ask, wait, let, the, let us make this even, I, I used to say, a small research is better than nothing. Yeah. 100%. Yeah. You know? And uh, I think, for example, we are talking late, uh, late, uh, before about data, but how much bias there is in this data? Who requests this data? How can I trust in this data? Trustworthy I, data. I need to, to check this. And that, for that, I need to do even a small research talk to some, for example, uh, there, is, there was a feature in my previous, my previous product and the, the clients, the consumers, customers start to complain about this. It was, a, we call it driver behavior. They, the, there is a telemetry in the cars and the, the, the company start to, to track the behavior of the, the drivers and the guys start to complain. And then the, we, we run an uh, interview session, but we remove, we try to remove all of the bias. We, we didn't tell, oh, we are from this company and, and we want to talk to you. No, we are from research company and we uh, want to talk to you as a driver. Mm. And then our, uh, our specialty research interview the guys and we put stakeholders, POs, PMs, dev team, everybody in a mirror room to watch the interview and then wow. the, the drivers start to tell the truth how they uh, what they think about the product about this feature and then we 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 made the report and we go to the director to show and the guy go totally crazy <laughs> totally crazy how you can say that how you can it doesn't it doesn't exist how many people you interview and then we say, oh, we, we interview around 15, eight, 15, 18 people. I talked to more than 100, 200 people in the branch. <laughs> okay, but you are wearing the badge and you are in our branch. Mm -hmm. you, you, you can believe in this, guys? You believe they tell the truth to you? What, what are you feeling about this? No. Okay. No. And no. <laughs> if, even if he, if he met something, some someone really really hang, angry okay these people will say bad things but otherwise he doesn't know it's nice it's good i'm happy because he does he need the car to work mm. he does that doesn't want to lose the car so it was totally crazy totally crazy and then nice. but uh we did this research and this interview section by ourselves because the the, the, the stakeholders and the, the, the other person involved in the product doesn't want to do. And I say, I will do by myself. And then I call the research and I call the team and I call the, the, the PO involved in this, this, because we work in, in a tribe and there's a specific team. This and I, was here or in Brazil? It's in Brazil. Ah, good yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but But after, after, the, after the, the director gone crazy, he said, no, I don't believe in this. I don't want to see this result. We talked to, to each other, and after all, the business department requests a rebrand for this feature. For this feature. And they say, okay, he doesn't accept, but now he knows there's a problem, and he, he requests the rebrand, and everything changed. So, yeah, I agree with that. 
I think within the right environment, sometimes you need to ask for forgiveness, not for permission. Yeah. I've done that a lot in my career. Most of the time it succeeded. Sometimes it fails, sometimes it's difficult, and sometimes you're in an environment like in the region where you can't do that. It's not politically correct, or you're gonna basically be told to sayonara, like you have to do what we say, and here are the requirements and build it. So I'm not telling everyone to go out and just do research. But other times you can do that on a smaller scale. You do, a, like you said, a little bit of research, a little bit of feedback you might say to them, hey, look, or even a research plan, not even research. Hey, I've done a research plan. I'd love to do a bit of research. Is it okay? Can we do a little bit? Perfect. I don't mind staying back or whatever, just to get the ball rolling to hopefully do some evidence-based design. No. For, for example, uh, I, 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 in this, this, this work, I request the access to the NPS report from the customer, customer success team. And every week I receive the report and every time, if I don't have time to do the proper research, okay, I received the, the task, I received the, 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 the requirements for the new feature, okay, I don't have time to, to do the proper research, but let me check in the NPS results if I can find something related to this. Mm -hmm. And then I filled, I put some filters and, and search in the, the, the answers for something or some regular answers about this subject and then I can find something, and okay, there is a base to, to do this. Nice. It's the, the tip. Well, I think it's time to wrap up. Um, and I would say, just as a last question to, to all of you, as, as you know, this is like the first foray back into Abu Dhabi since COVID, and we'd love to continue to, to come back and give um, insights and uh, growth and learning that's relevant to you. Um, does anyone have anything that they think they would you know, love to know more about or in the next sessions? Now that we've got you all here, you can get some mm. user research from you. Live. <laughs> Live from, from now. Any topics yeah. that people are really interested in or any, um, or also if, if someone wants to speak, there's great people in Abu Dhabi. I think the, the thing I found 10 to whatever, seven years ago, um, was that not as many people come to you know some of these events, I think. Like there are some great designers, but sometimes they're just working hard or with their families, but it's, uh, it, I don't know. Things obviously have changed over time, I'm sure. And, and I think it's, it's also about awareness, right? So, yeah. So even if you can't think of anything, Message us. Message us on One thing I, I think we can touch upon is uh, how to be a really good product leader. Uh, what what it is a product leader should have a management uh, while you're building the team or managing the team and so on. Mm -hmm. Or how should they manage the stakeholder relationship? Things like that. I've done a lot of hiring, but on your on your second question, um, again, I'm going to. Uh, I think it would be great to get Leopold, who's sitting at the back there. He's done a great talk for us in the past, but to do a talk perhaps on similar to the one you've done, but slightly different, more targeted at better storytelling for product people, designers included to translate the value of what they do and how that translates into business success. It, it's one that many product people are continuously trying to crack, right? I, I, I learned, like I was saying earlier, I learned that in Australia where it can't just be the success of the design team. We know we're great. We know we're doing great research, great product. 
but we need to translate this to business. And that's something that's not that simple. That's why it's, uh, I think it's definitely a good topic, something we can plan for for next year. Anything else, or do you have? Yeah, I'd, I'd really like to learn more about the, I know you touched a little bit on it, but I really want to understand what exactly to expect of a product design team. So what is success for them? How do I make sure that they do their job? How do I make sure that you know, and, and I want to have like fair expectations. So I don't want to put on them. You guys have to make me reach a product market fit and get me all of these, you know, quick contracts. And at the same time, I want to, you know, I want to be fair to them. I want to make sure that they're delivering what they're supposed to do. You know, like a design for non-designers kind of. Mm. Uh, I I I don't do designs. So I'm, I'm not into like. Do you have stuff. good, mature product managers? I do. I, I have like three product managers, uh, and I have like four designers. And uh, the product managers do discovery. They talk to they, customers, for example. They talk to stakeholders. They they actually did until actually. I, so back to your point, I actually read a book called The Mom Test. Yes. Which is Very excellent cool. in terms of it made me see that we were doing all of these interviews the wrong way, and we're getting <laughs> wrong answers all the time, and we were validating the product based on these answers, and they weren't true. So I, I really want to understand from an organizational perspective how to manage what to expect out of a design team. Okay. Yeah. Good one. Right. Anyone else have any requests? Leadership. What was that? Leadership. Leadership. Okay. So same similar question. Similar. Yeah. Yeah, we, we did want to speak about that. We didn't do a huge amount tonight, but we can definitely, I think that, that's definitely a good one. Try to touch on that. And we've tried many formats, right? It's not always a, a fireside chat. There's also a presentation, we could be a panel, could be a, I mean, with Abu Dhabi having smaller numbers, we could also do a, a, a workshop, like yeah. more hands-on. Thanks everyone for coming. Thank you. Thank you.